Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he have done. Amen. Amen. I'm, not, I'm in no ways tired. Amen. I'm running for my life. Praise the Lord. Welcome to the Kingdom of Grace Ministries. Again, welcome to the Kingdom of Grace Ministries. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. The kingdom of grace, the territory of grace, the territory of favor. Amen. Money run out, but favor is unlimited. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to uh, pray, and we're going to get ready to get started. Heavenly Father, we bow before you, just giving you honor, giving you praise. Saw the hand of the Lord that was there with us all the time. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for not dealing with us according to our sins, but you extended a hand of love and mercy. And for that, we're so thankful. Heavenly Father, as we get ready, God, to worship you and to break open the bread of life, Lord, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Heavenly Father, help us not only to do better, but to become better, that we can be useful, your, for, useful to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, what we're going to be looking at today uh, in our text, we're going to be looking at two scriptures. Uh, maybe a couple later on, but the first one is found in Genesis chapter 19, Genesis chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 15 through 17, and then we're going to read verses 24 through 26, and then our next text is going to be 2 Peter chapter 2, Verses 4 through 6. So that's Genesis 19, 15 through 17, 24 through 26, and then 2 Peter 2. Uh, chapter 4. I'm, I'm sorry, chapter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. And I'm going to give you a, a minute to find that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, and it reads in Genesis from the King James Bible, chapter 19, verses 15 through 17. It says, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon him upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand uh hold on and upon the hand of his two daughters the lord being merciful unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city verse 17 and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said escape for thy life Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Verses 24 through 26. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Uh, 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6. 2 Peter 2, through 4 through 6. And I'm going to read from the King James Bible, 2 Peter chapter 2, 4, 4 through 6. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them, into chains of darkness to be, reserved, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example 
unto those that after live ungodly, making them an example unto those that after live ungodly. Amen. May God's blessing be upon the reading of the word. Amen. And the title of our message today is Remember Lot's Wife. Amen. Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife was covered in the residue of a fallen society. I want you to think about that for a minute. According to archaeologists, there's still evidence of Lot's wife's body still there in Sodom and Gomorrah. She turned to a pillar of salt. According to archaeologists, it was an earthquake and a volcano that erupted around that period of time. Amen. And when an earthquake, when, it, when a volcano erupts, it spews lava, sulfur, brimstone, salt, all of this stuff goes up into the atmosphere and then it rains down. Amen? Praise the Lord. So Lot's wife was covered in the residue of a fallen society. What is residue? Residue is a small part, a portion that remains after the main part no longer exists. In other words, this was a testimony against her in terms of what God was destroying in her life. In other words, what God, God told her not to look back. But she looked back in her heart first before she turned and looked back. It all starts in the heart. And what God was trying to deliver her from or trying to destroy, God let it rain down on her as a residue of her past. It was a testimony against her, so everybody that passed by her can say, remember Lot's wife. What God was destroying was still attached to her life. It started in her heart, but whatever starts in her heart, it manifests on the outside. So what was in her heart showed up on the outside, and God left that as a testimony of what he was trying to destroy. She was covered in the residue of a fallen society. So what are the characteristics of a fallen society? If you don't be aware of history, history has a way of repeating itself. itself. You should learn from history. They said, remember Lot's wife. It's a testimony against her. Amen. The characteristics of a fallen society. The indicator of social collapse is noted by the downfall of government and the rise of violence. The downfall of government and the rise of, 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 of violence is an indicator of the collapse the collapse of society, of fallen society. Now, possible causes are natural catast catastrophes. You know, we have earthquakes in diverse places. We have floods. We have famines. We have all these things. War. War. Threats of war. Rumors of war. Pestilence. Pandemics. Pestilence. Diseases. The monkey uh, virus, all these things that's coming out one after another, one on top of another. Famine, economic collapse, population decline, mass migration, moral decay because of unrestrained sin. A collapsed society may revert to a more primitive state. They'll go, back to, they'll go back to the Stone Age. Or it may be absorbed into a stronger society. The New World Order. The One World Government System. Someone else has to take the wheel because you can't handle your business. So the government going to handle your business for you. Or it completely disappears like the Roman Empire did. It completely dissolves. So, 2 Peter 2 and 6, Sodom and Gomorrah were a warning to future generations 
that will follow the example. So if we don't learn from history, it has a way of repeating itself. People have a tendency to gravitate back to their past where they find security. See, Lot's wife, it doesn't even call her name. It just says Lot's wife. She wanted to gravitate back to her past where she found security. Now, the instructions that God originally gave Lot were to go to the mountains. He said, no, I, I, I don't want to go to the mountains. He said, don't stop in the plain. Keep going till you get to the mountains. He said, well, just let me stop at the city called Zor. I, I'll be okay there. So God said, okay, go and stay there. But don't stop in the plain. Amen. God does have permissive will. If you want something bad enough, God will give you what you want. And once you get it, you don't want it. Praise the Lord. Covered in the residue of a fallen society. Whatever overcomes you enslaves you. Whether it be a person, thing, philosophy, or concept. Once you regress and become entangled with what God delivered you from, your present situation is worse than your past. That's why the Bible says when, when the man was delivered from so many demons, if you go back, they, your house is clean, then he'll come and get some more demons and you'll get twice as many demons when he come back. Your, past, your present situation will be worse than your past. Amen. Don't look back. Keep moving forward. Amen. Praise the Lord. So you keep looking and moving forward. Don't look back to your old house and try to rebuild your life again from your past. Amen. Pray for God to give you courage not to turn back to what you left behind. Now the word of God says... In Proverbs 4 and 23, we're going to turn to that. Proverbs 4 and 23. Praise the Lord. And all of these, these uh, societies that God destroyed was not because of the sin they committed. It was, it was because of heart wickedness. The motives of their heart, the intents of their heart that was carried out in their actions. But it started in the heart. It was heart wickedness. Amen. So Proverbs 4 and 23. Praise the Lord. 4 and 23. It said, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In other words, be careful what you allow to penetrate your spirit or what you allow to resonate in your spirit. Amen. Because you will eventually reproduce what's inside of you. Why am I saying guard your heart? Because Lot's wife was destroyed. She was turned into a pillar of salt because of what was in her heart. She was moving forward, but she was looking back in her heart. And God said, don't look back. Don't try to go back to what I'm trying to deliver you from. This was a testimony for future generations to guard your heart with all, dil all diligence because out of it springs the issues of life. Amen. See, remember, God examines and he judges the intents of our heart. Amen. According to the Bible, the heart of man is his worst part before regeneration. Because the Bible says man's heart is desperately wicked and evil continuously. Only evil. Not part evil and part good. The Bible says only evil continuously before regeneration. But it's the best part after regeneration. But our greatest difficulty, difficulty after conversion is to win our hearts over to God. We are exhorted to keep our hearts with all diligence. And the reason, the motive behind this exhortation is because from it flows the issues of life. We have a duty to keep our hearts from doing hurt and getting hurt. By being defiled by sin and disturbed by trouble. 
Guard your heart. Amen. What you listen to, what you watch, what you allow to resonate in your spirit. Praise the Lord. There are various ways of keeping things. Some examples are by extreme care. If you got a garden, you get out there, you pull the weeds, you fertilize, you water, you do everything. It's extreme care, detail. You got a golf course, you manicure, detail, extreme care. Or you can do it by strength. You can have guards to protect you. You can have bodyguards. You can keep things by strength or by calling for help. Amen. As Christians, we must utilize everything that's available to, available to us. Manage it, pull the weeds, stay on top of it, care for it, guard it, protect it, and ask for help if you need it. Take advantage of all your resources to guard your heart. Praise the Lord. The heart is used as a metaphor for a particular noble faculty of the soul. Medically speaking, the heart is the first to live and it's the last to die. What they do when a woman is pregnant, they check the heartbeat of the baby. What happens when a person dies? That last heartbeat, they gone. Amen. How can a doctor tell you, uh, I give them 24 hours and they're going to be gone? Wait a minute. They were just eating a hamburger. They were talking to me. They was watching TV. How can you say that? What's nothing wrong with them? Why? Because your, your, your body gives off elect, electrical signals. It gives off energy. And whenever that energy gets below 30, that means your body is starting to shut down. So they, they know, okay, you look okay now, you're acting okay, but 24 hours from now, you're going to be gone. Your body starts to shut down. Amen. So your heart is the first to live, and it's the last to die, physically and spiritually speaking. That's why it says, guard your heart. The devil ain't your worst enemy. You're your worst enemy. Guard your heart. Praise the Lord. So, all the actions of life flow from the heart, spiritual and physical. Your heart regulates your blood. It pushes your blood through your body. Drain all your blood and you die. It keeps you living. Yeah, your brain sends, sends signals to your heart to call it to be, but your heart keeps your body living. It keeps it flowing. And even in a spiritual sense, if your heart is corrupt and your whole body is corrupt, amen, if the, if the eye is dim, the whole body is dim, praise the Lord. In Romans 1 and 21, it represents the understanding part where it says the foolish hearts, which is their understanding, was darkened. In Psalms 119.11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. The heart is used to represent memory. In 1 John 3 and 20, it says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. The heart in this text is used for the conscious, which places it in both light of understanding and the recollection of memory. When John says our, heart, says our heart condemns us, he means our conscience. Praise the Lord. To guard our hearts is a military term. Not only to protect from enemies without, but also from invaders within. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We must monitor our spirits. We are admonished to keep our hearts. The duty is ours, but the power is God's. You can't keep yourself. You can examine yourself, but you can't diagnose yourself. I know that from, from experience. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. I know that from experience. Okay, now, to keep a heart is to maintain a repentful spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. David said to search my heart and try me. See if there'll be any wicked way within me and renew a right spirit within me. So the manner of performance duty, the manner of performance duty as well as diligence. The Hebrew word is emph emphatic, which means keeping with all keeping. It's an emphatic word in the Bible. Keeping with all keeping. In other words, it's a double negative. It means to set double guards. 
When you say guard your heart, it don't mean just guard your heart. It's emphatic. It's a double negative. It means keeping with all keeping. In other words, you said double guard or your heart will be lost. The reason or motive behind this duty is because for from the heart flow the springs of life. The heart is the source and fountain of all vital actions and decisions, whether good or evil. So it says to set double guards. In other words, you got to guard your heart from things that's coming in, and you got to guard your heart from things that's going to come out of it. So you set double guards. It's a double negative. Not only I'm going to protect myself from the world, I'm going to make a covenant with my eyes, like Job said, yeah, but you got to guard your heart from what you're going to spew out on somebody also. Amen. From what comes in and from what goes out. Because man's heart is inherently evil, there are certain implications of keeping our heart that we must adhere to. The grace of God that was extended to us at the point of salvation set our heart on a new inclination towards God and away from the world. So once we became born again, instead of our heart being bent towards the world, now it's bent towards God. It's inclined towards the things of God. So our old self, in other words, is like a rudder on a ship. It wants to steer us away from the things of God and turn us back to the world. So you got a rudder on the ship. The ship is going a certain direction. But all you got to do is just tilt that rudder just a little bit, and all of a sudden that ship is going to start turning. So you got to guard your heart because you want to go in a certain direction for God. But if you don't monitor your heart, if your heart starts tilting, your whole body is going to tilt. Because what? Out of the heart flow the issues of life. So it's like a rudder on a ship. Amen. It's a small organ, but it controls the whole body. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, our old self is like a rudder. It wants to steer us away from the things of God and turn us back towards the world. See, it's just all you got to do is shift that rudder. You don't have to turn it all the way like a steering wheel. All you got to do is just shift it just a few degrees. And if you leave it right there in that position, that ship is going to eventually make a big old U-turn. Eventually. It'll be a wide turn, but it's going to eventually turn. That's why you got to monitor it. When you see yourself getting off track, off course, you got to wait a minute. Let me check my heart. Let me get my heart back in line with the things of God. I'm not loving like I used to. I'm not praying like I used to. I don't have a desire for the things of God like I used to. Praise the Lord. So it takes constant care and diligence to preserve and daily maintain our soul in the framework that grace has put us in. Praise the Lord. Job 11 and 13. If you prepare your heart, you will stretch out your hands towards him. Therefore, to prepare and keep our heart is to carefully preserve it from sin, which disorders it, and to maintain a life of communion with God. Sin is just like, it's just like a, a disease. Whenever your body's at disease, it's out of order. It's, it's not in harmony with itself. It's not functioning like it should. And sin is like a cancer. It throws our body off balance. It's a disease of the body. Sin is a disease to the body. It's a disease to the spirit. In order to accomplish this, there are six steps or principles that we must observe. Number one, we must frequently observe the frame of our heart. I'm not talking about a, a picture frame. I'm talking about frame from a, a, in, in, in terms of a noun, a particular state or disposition. That's what, it, what frame of mind are you in? To look within, to examine its present condition. In other words, you know what you're guilty of. I know what I'm guilty of. I know what I'm struggling with. You know what you're struggling with. Examine the frame of your heart. What condition is your heart in? If you're, un, if you're an unbeliever, and I ask you today, if you were to die today, do you, are you sure you would go to heaven? Well, I don't know. I, I, I hope I would. No, it ain't about hoping and wishing. Or do you know for sure what's the frame of your heart? Do you need to forgive somebody? Amen. Don't wait till they die and then you laying over the, the casket crying and hollering. Amen. It's too late then. 
Where a tree fall, that's where it lie. Praise. What's the frame of your heart? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Psalm 77 and 6 says, let me examine, let me meditate in my heart. You can never keep your heart until you examine this condition. You can't keep it till you examine this condition. Truck drivers that's on the road all the time, they're constantly checking their tires. They're looking to see if it's dripping oil because they need that truck. That truck is their livelihood. They're going to constantly, you can't just let stuff go down and, on, and, and then when it break down on you, you're wondering what happened because you didn't monitor it. You didn't do your maintenance on it. Amen. A lot of stuff, a lot of breakdowns won't happen if we do our regular maintenance. You know your start is acting up, but you're going to get up under the car and hit it with a hammer. Praise the Lord. I know what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, somebody else know what I'm talking about, too. <laughs> Y'all remember the old days? That starter started acting up. You kept a hammer in the car, and you crawl up on that thing and hit it with a hammer a couple times, and it started back. Amen. Got some duct tape and, and some grip pliers. And, and, and a couple of screwdrivers in your car all the time. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay. Number two, humble yourselves and let God examine your heart and tell you the truth about yourself. Don't lie to me. Tell me the truth. If it's something I need to change, I want to know. I don't want to stand before God and then go, I'm thinking I'm okay only to find out that I'm not. Amen. First Kings 8 and 38. What prayer and supplication so ever be made by any man or by all the people, Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward this house, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give every man according to his way. So God's going to examine the tent of our heart, whose heart thou knowest. God know your heart. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men. So in other words, be honest with God. Point to the areas that you're hurting, the areas that need healing, and the issues that you're struggling with. The Spirit of God will cleanse and heal those areas. Amen. And we got to acknowledge that we need God's help. Number three. When sin has entered our hearts, we need to pray for God's purifying and sanctifying grace. You should repent every day. Psalms 19 and 12. Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Hidden faults. Stuff that nobody knows about but you. Psalms 86, 11. Unite my heart to fear your name. Just like when a particle of dust gets in the eye, your eye won't stop watering and winking until it gets it out. It's going it's to wink it out, and it's going to water it out. And it's not going to stop because it's a foreign object. It's something that doesn't need to be there. And the same way with our heart. When things are in our heart that shouldn't be there, and God reveals that to us, that heart should not stop watering and crying out until it waters it out through repentance. Not just, oh, I'm sorry. No, you should, you should really be sorry. You should cry. You should weep over your condition. Amen. A, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, God will not refuse. Amen. Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Covered in the residue of a fallen society. What God was trying to destroy, she was trying to hold on to. And it was a testimony against, against her to those future generations that's trying to hold on to stuff that God is trying to destroy. God told Saul, destroy the Amalekites. Utterly destroy them. But he tried to hold on, and then he tried to justify holding on to something God told him to get rid of. God said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Do what I told you to do. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, number four, employ strong vows and bonds upon yourself. Put yourself in check. Put, put vows on yourself. Put conditions on yourself. Don't just be loosey-goosey. Don't just run around like everything is okay, tiptoeing through the tulips like everything is fine. If you know something is wrong, check yourself. David said, I'm, I'm, I'm rough with my body. I mean, Paul said, I bring my body under subjection. You body slam it. You body slam that sin. You body slam that self, that self, that old man. You can't play with the old man. Do him like the police do. Throw him up against the wall, slap him around, put his head on the car. Put him on the concrete. 
Slam it. We have to be rough with, we got to be rough with ourselves. Oh, it's okay, God. Now God don't understand. Amen. God destroyed, God indicted a whole world and destroyed a whole world, not because of the sins they were committed, but because of the wickedness, the conditions of their hearts, which led to the outbreak of the, or the manifestation of the sin. It starts in the heart. Destroyed. Noah and his family, the only one survived. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Amen. You got to check yourself. You got to make a covenant with your eyes. You can't stop from seeing everything that passes by, but you don't have to let it resonate in your spirit. You don't have to let your heart become an incubator for sin and think about it all day and ponder on it. Because if you ponder on it long enough, you're going to act on it. Amen. It starts in the heart. Praise the Lord. So maintain a constant reverence and fear of God. If we do this, we will suppress our affections and passions before they escalate. Once you get to the point of no return, you ain't returning. Amen. You got to suppress your passions before they escalate, before they get to the breaking or the boiling point. Amen. You know when it's starting. Amen. Praise the Lord. It says, Proverbs 28 and 14, blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. Since God's presence with you and realize that God is always watching us. He's monitoring what go, the thoughts that go through our head. He's watching everything. And guess what? God is going to judge the intent and the motive of our heart. A lot of things people do, they don't even do it for the right reason. That's why God said a lot of work's going to be burned up. Why? Because it wasn't done for the right reason. Hard work is the hardest work. It doesn't take a lot of effort to go about religious duties with a careless spirit, to go about the regular routine. But in order to keep our spirits in check and keep our thoughts channeled in the right direction, it takes a lot more discipline and effort. Amen. Praise the Lord. It takes a lot more discipline. Everybody, you can't, you can't go to God's heaven without wanting a God that the God that created that heaven. You don't want God, but you want his heaven. You want the benefits. I preached last week about hell, about eternity. Where would you stand? Amen. It's more people going to hell than it is going to heaven. Amen. The Bible say narrow is the way, and few there'll be that find it. So in order to find something, you got to be looking for it. And guess what? The judgment, when we stand in judgment, whether it's the white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ, is one common denominator between both judgments. It's going to be a judgment of ethics, moral values. God's going to judge the tent of our hearts. Amen. That's why the Bible says, him that is wicked, let him be wicked still. Him that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Him that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Amen. Because you're only going to reproduce what's inside of you. You can wear, you can wear a facade all day long, but God is going to examine the intent of our heart. She looked back in her heart, and it was a testimony to future generations. Whatever God is delivering you from, don't go back and try to rebuild your past from your old house. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hard work is constant work. It's a lifelong, continual process. Hard work is the most important work of our Christian walk and oftentimes the most neglected. We can pray for everybody else. We can pray for our family. We can pray about our finances. We can pray for the country, the president. We can pray for the starving people. We can pray for all this kind of stuff. We pray for everything but the condition of our heart. The first thing God shows you when you pray is yourself. It ain't somebody else. God's showing you somebody else's sin. What about your sin? Praise the Lord. Amen. What about your sin? What about the sin that's in my heart? It's easy for me to point to someone else. Oh, you, you got sin. God told me to tell you. Okay, what is God telling you about yourself? What's in your heart? Praise the Lord. God's going to examine the tent of our hearts. Praise the Lord. The most neglected. The condition of the heart is what's most important to God. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at and examines the heart. 
Proverbs 23 and 26. It says, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. God puts honor on us to receive our heart as a gift to him. He said, give me your heart. But if it's not given to him, he disregards everything else that we bring. God said, give me your heart first. Give me your heart. Give it to me as a gift. Present it to me. Let me, let me massage your heart. Let me bring it back to life. Let, let me soften it. Let me operate on it. Amen. But if you don't give God your heart first, it says he, he, he disregards everything else you give him. You can give your body to be burned. Okay. Don't mean nothing to me. You can give a million dollars. It don't mean nothing to God. Give me your heart. You can build a big old mega church. It don't mean nothing to God. Give me your heart first. Give me, because if you don't give me your heart, see, God wants to control your heart. Why? Because out of the heart proceeds the issues of life, flows the issues of life. Everything, life flows from the heart, physical and spiritual life. Give God your heart. Amen. She looked back in the heart. Amen. It's not always physical. It's not always physical. Sin, sin, sin starts with a, an appearance of something. It could be something tangible that you can see, or it can be an imagination in your mind. You don't, even have to, you don't have to visually see it. It could be something in your mind where it starts. Amen. So God wants to examine our heart. So the worth of value in what we do is directly related to the heart we put in it. A lot of people doing stuff, but they ain't putting their heart in it. They're just working when the boss is looking. They're just doing it just to, just to get a little a, a, a brownie point. Thinking that somebody see it. They want somebody to see them doing it. Oh, I saw you doing that. Yeah, but what did God? You can be, you can be, <clears throat> excuse me, you can be in a mega church or a mega auditorium with, with 10,000 people. And, and, and you're doing something, but you're doing it for the wrong motive. And everybody is shouting and praising and clapping and, and calling your name. And Jesus sitting on the back row and he's frowning. I wrote everybody, everybody else be quiet and mad and get up and walk out. And Jesus stand up and clap like he did for Stephen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Your heart. A heart for the things of God. A heart that's turned away from the world and it's inclined towards the things of God. People don't want, people don't want God nowadays. I remember Lazarus died and a rich man died. Oh, you, if you can just send somebody to tell my brother, let them hear the prophets. They got them. It's a church on every corner. It's all sorts of Bible software. People don't want nothing from God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because people don't want to be held accountable. That's the problem. People's heart is not inclined to the things of God. It's inclined to the things of the world. You can see it even in the church. Praise the Lord. I preached last week about hell, eternity. Where will you stand? And the whole message was about hell, the inhabitants of hell, a whole description of hell. Nobody want to hear that. Preach on some prophecy, you get a thousand views. Amen. Call a prayer meeting, and there may be four people show up. Might be two. Might be me, by myself, depending on what day it is. Amen. But I guarantee you, you tell everybody to be to church at 4 in the morning, and we got a bus that's, that's going to Galveston, and we're going to take a cruise ship to the Bahamas, and the church paying for it. It'd be cars lined up all the way around, around the corner at 3.30. I can't even park in my parking spot because they parked up there. I got to park down the street somewhere. Oh, we having a concert. Kirk Franklin going to be here. Oh, you see people you ain't seen in 10 years. But you call a prayer meeting. Oh, we're we not going to have service today. We're just going to pray. Oh, I thought we was having service. I thought the pastor was going to preach. I'm going. I got to go. Okay, go ahead and leave. That, that flow too hard. Bring a pillar. Bring a pillar. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
What if I say we're not going to stream next Sunday? I want everybody to come to church and bring a pillow. We're going to pray. See how many people show up. Praise the Lord. Members, not visitors. Praise the Lord. The truth hurt, don't it? Y'all want me to tell you something to make you feel good. Ain't nothing about feeling good. We're in the last days. We're getting ready for a cash of society. It's threat of nuclear war. Everything is like the stage is being set right now. We are seeing the end times unfold right now. People are being killed. Christians are being killed. And the Bible talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. It was six million Jews killed by Hitler, and the Bible said it's going to be worse this time around. We're in the last days. Everybody going around like ain't nothing, ain't nothing happening. Ain't no, it, it's not going to get no better. Don't think the world is getting any better. It's getting worse. Amen. This is the time we should be really seeking God. The Bible says that my people that are called by my name shall arm themselves and pray and seek my face and do what? Turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll, for, I'll heal from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal the land. The land need a healing. Why the land ain't healed? Because the church ain't seeking God's face. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I ain't going to get a whole lot of amens because I'm telling the truth. Praise the Lord. We got to get back. We need a revival. We got to get back to prayer. Amen. Praise the Lord. We do everything but pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's getting quiet. We do everything but pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. The truth that you know, the truth that you adhere to, is what, what makes you free, am I right? Sometimes the truth hurts. The Bible says what? Examine, let every man examine himself. Examine your heart. Amen. I examine my heart. This message ain't just for you, it's for me also. How can you say you, 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 you love somebody and you don't communicate with them? Only time you talk to God is when you, when you got a problem. That's the only time you pray. Praise the Lord. Only time you open your Bible is when you come to church. Praise the Lord. Examine our heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wasn't planning on going there, but I went there. Praise the Lord. So, the worth of value in what we do is directly related to the heart we put into it. God examines our heart in great detail. Among the heathens, this is the heathens. In biblical times, when an animal was cut up for sacrifice, the first thing the priest looked at was the heart. If the heart wasn't no good, he disregarded the sacrifice. This was a priest, a satanic priest. First thing he examined was the heart. The heart ain't good, so the animal must be corrupt. So I don't even want it. The heart ain't good. The first thing he examined was the heart. It was rejected. So you don't think God going to look at your heart? He's not looking at how you dress. Well, I, don't, I just wear a long dress. I just do this. And I quit doing this and I quit doing God ain't. God is looking at our heart. Do we have a heart for God or do we have a heart, a heart for the things of the world? Amen. God's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Amen. And when we stand before God, God's going to examine. He's not going to count how many times we went to church. He's going to look at the intent of our hearts. Lot's wife covered in the residue of a fallen society. Amen. Whatever God was destroying, she, she was covered in it. It was evidence to everybody. What was in her heart, not everybody saw it. It was a testimony against her. I don't, need, I don't want God to expose me. That's why I want to examine my heart first. See, I don't want God. God doesn't always, God don't arbitrarily expose people. God always sends warning first before he sends judgment. God is the same God that was in 1906 on Azusa Street when they had a revival that lasted two years, nonstop, wheelchairs, crutches all around the wall where people had gotten healed. People getting baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
I witness people get receiving the Holy Ghost. People getting sanctified. People getting healed. He's the same God. God haven't changed. We've changed. Amen. Praise the Lord. God said, get back to the old land. Examine our heart. Is it, is it God's fault? Is it our fault? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Don't tell me how God is love. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about love and heaven. He said, cut off your hand if you have to. He wasn't saying mutilate your body. He said, but, but whatever cause it takes to escape that place, do it. Because hell is real. And everybody talking about heaven ain't going to heaven. Praise the Lord. You can hope and wish all day long. You can click your heels together, but you ain't in Kansas. This is real. God's going to examine our heart. But you know what? I'm going to examine my heart first. Praise the Lord. I'm not trying to win a popularity contest. I want to go to heaven. And I want to tell people the truth. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A lot of stuff we say God okay with, he ain't okay with it. We okay with it. Praise the Lord. So why is keeping the heart so vitally important? Number one is for the glory of God. It's for the sincerity of our profession. It's for the beauty of our conversation, the comfort of our souls, improvement of our graces, and the ability to withstand temptation. Number one, the glory of God. The glory of God is dependent on the condition of our heart. Genesis 6 and 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the great crime for which the whole world was indicted and destroyed was heart wickedness. It wasn't the stuff they was doing. That was a manifestation. It was their hearts was wicked. Moses gave a decree of divorce because he said, God hates divorce, but guess what? Y'all not going to reconcile. Why? Y'all ain't going to forgive each other. Y'all going to fight like cats and dogs. So it's better that y'all just go on, go on divorce because y'all ain't going to change. Y'all be living in a house, but y'all, it's just a warm body. That's all. Y'all not on the same page. But it wasn't God's intention. What? But because the hardness of man's heart, God allowed certain things to transpire. Praise the Lord. So, Genesis 6 and 7, after he saw the wickedness, it says, So the Lord said, I will blot out man from whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals, and creeping things, and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. So although mankind were defiled with many outward sins, God did not call them out for them. He called out the evil intentions of their heart, which led to the outward manifestation of the sins. Jeremiah 4 and 14. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil that you may be saved. How long shall your wicked thoughts lodge within you? In other words, God took special note of the wickedness and the vanity of their thoughts. The sincerity of our profession. Psalms 119.11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Our sincerity is seen in our pursuit to do right in the sight of God. So how do you know a person is sincere? They're always pursuing doing right. They want to know what they're doing wrong so they can correct it. I don't want nobody to pat me on the back. Well, you know, uh-uh. Tell me the truth. If there's something I need to change, I need to know. I don't want to stand before God and he say, depart from me. See, hell is real. Hell is eternal. And just because we think we're going there, we better make sure that the Bible says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, the righteous, those that's in right standing with God, those that's praying, those that's fasting, those that's seeking God's face are going to barely make it in. What about those that are on the borderline, those that are prayerless Christians, the worldly Christians? The Christians don't spend time for God, but you got time for everything else. Praise the Lord. I feel like John the Baptist, somebody crying in the wilderness. Praise the Lord. And, and we, it's even a famine for the word of God nowadays. 
just like it was in the Old Testament. People ain't preaching the word no more. They preaching this, this, this friendly gospel, this Burger King gospel, have it your way. Well, this church, I don't like this church. I like this church because, you know, they okay with this. Well, I go to this one because I don't like this one because they don't like this. No, it's not a friendly, uh, friendly uh, gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said the gospel that Jesus preached and John the Baptist preached was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, get your house in order. Get your act together. We don't know how we, we, we hope we get raptured. We may have to go into part of the tribulation. And if we do, and they start giving out the mark, and they start doing all these things, and we see people being beheaded, and it's martial law, you better make sure that you got what you say you got. Amen. You may not have time to get it together. Forget about the thief on the cross. I'm sick of hearing about the thief on the cross. Deathbed repentance. Who say you're going to get a chance to die? I mean, to pray before you die. To repent before you die. Amen. Quit hiding behind that. God said, be holy because I'm holy. We should strive for holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our sincerity is seen in our pursuit to do right in the sight of God. When we do fall on occasion, our repentance and grief over our condition reveals that we want to maintain an upright heart with God. So when you do fall, oh God, I'm so sorry. It shows that you really want to get right with God. But you can't keep going on and on and on and ain't nothing wrong with it. Amen. You can go everywhere else, but you can't come to church. Go to work, sick, not feeling well. I don't feel good. I'm going to stay home. Come to church. I remember the day if you didn't feel good, you came to church and you got healed. You go to work, not feeling good. You go to H-E-B, not feeling good. You sit up in the restaurant around unsaved people. You don't know where they've been, what they've been doing. You're sitting in there an hour and a half eating. Don't nobody have a mask on. Praise the Lord. You come to church and you're scared. I'm telling the truth. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Either say amen or say ouch. I got one amen. Good. Like I said, I ain't preaching for no popularity contest. I got to preach the truth. Whether people like it or not, I got to preach it. If it affects me, I'm going to preach it. Amen. God hates sin. The church has become worldly. Praise the Lord. We need to get back to our old landmark. You want to see a move of God? You want to see a revival? Get back on your knees and do like we used to do. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm glad it's like it is because it's showing, it's showing really what's in people's heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. We don't need a praise team. Praise team need to be at the altar, at the altar praying. Once they get right, then they come up here and praise. Amen. Minister of music, they need to be at the altar praying. They get right, then they get up here. Amen. We always prayed first before we came up here. We didn't just waltz up here. Uh-uh. No, any kind of way. Just left the club, just left this, just left this, walk up here, and, and they set in the atmosphere. Yeah, they just set in the atmosphere, all right. Praise the Lord. Ain't my atmosphere. My atmosphere is set with prayer. Amen. Boy, it's a lot of people mad now. Boy, there's some people watching this mad. That's okay. You'll get over it. I'm not backing down on what I said because if it's true, if it's not the truth, call me out. Amen. Anybody, if it ain't the truth, call me out. Praise the Lord. I'm a word man. I'm going to stand on the word. Period. Because the word's going to stand. My opinion don't mean nothing. But God's word means everything. I'm going to have to stand before God. Don't you know I got to stand before God and give an account for everything I say while I'm standing behind this, this sacred podium? I didn't say I'm perfect. But I'm striving to make heaven. And I want people to know the truth because hell is real. 
And if we don't get our act together, a lot of people think they go, it's going to be a lot of religious people in hell. A lot of church people in hell. I don't want to be one of them. We got time to do everything else. We don't have time to pray. Don't have time to seek God. It's the first time we get in trouble. Oh, God, get me out of this. Too tired to come to church. Too tired to come to church? You can go everywhere else. You, you can get up and go to work and you have sleep. You have tired. Pushing yourself out of bed. You can go to work. You can go everywhere else. Praise the Lord. Amen. Number three, the beauty of our conversation. Matthew 15 and 19, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12, it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. So if somebody has an accusation against you, let it be false. Oh, I saw brother so-and-so doing so. Okay, let it be false. Let it be gossip. Don't let it be true. Amen. Don't let it be true. We must abstain from the passions of the flesh. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles or the unbelievers honorable. Our thoughts reveal the frame of our heart. The way and course of our life flow from our thoughts or the frame of our heart. Our thoughts are made into affections, then they materialize into actions and practices. Thoughts turn into affections, or thoughts create affections. You think about something, all of a sudden you get a certain feeling when you think about a certain thing. It create, your thoughts create affections. Then they materialize into actions. And then a lot of times, the actions can't be just a one time. Sometimes it turns into a practice. Now you're practicing a weakness. So it also, number four, the comfort of our souls. Real comfort and peace is a byproduct of guarding and maintaining your heart. So if you really want real com uh, comfort and peace, you want to sleep good at night, or clear conscience, keep your heart pure. You ain't got to worry. You ain't got to look over your shoulder. You ain't got to worry about who's out to get you. You ain't got to worry about who's going to find out something that you did. Because you got a clear conscience. You keep your heart. You know, I ain't doing nothing wrong, even if you're falsely accused. I didn't steal from that company. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. You know, because you know that you, you have a, 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 a conscience that's void of offense towards man and towards God. Number five. The improvement of our graces, Ephesians 3, 7 through 20. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, add to knowledge the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, uh, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then it says, now unto him that is able to do a seal above all that we can think or ask according to the power that works in us. So in other words, God's grace is rooted in our heart and is worked out through our hearts. So the grace of God that he's extended to man is planted in our heart. You have to have a heart that has, has, has fallow ground to receive and nurture and germinate the grace of God, then it shows abroad, it goes to others because it flows from our heart. It enters our heart and it flows from our heart. So if you want more grace from God, God gives you grace to your heart. The grace is extended by the condition of your heart. The better prepared your heart is, the more grace God gives you. It's not on a plate. He doesn't hand it to you on a plate like food. He gives it to your heart. Amen. And it extends out of your heart. So, so a person that has a, a, a good heart, a loving heart, they're going to be a giving, loving person, a forgiving person, because it flows from their heart. But a person that has a bitter heart, unforgiveness, they're not going to be a giving, loving person. 
because they're harboring stuff. They're harboring root of bitterness in their heart. That's why the condition of our heart is even more important than the condition of our mind. You can have thoughts in your mind all day long, but what about what's in your heart? God looks at your heart. Amen. So, number six, the ability to withstand temptation. That's why we should guard our heart. Number one, when temptation first appears, there's the actual presence of the object of our temptation. God, the, the devil knows what you like. So it's the first appearance is the object of your temptation. Or by imagination, the object that enters our mind. So if, if that person or that thing don't walk by you, then that thing can enter your mind through imagination. That's the first thing that happens with temptation. Number two, next, the appetite is stimulated, which provokes desire for pleasure. So either you see it, you imagine it, now you got certain things going on in your body. Now it's an appetite. You're stimulated. You want pleasure, whatever it is. Number three, then the mind reasons a cause to pursue it. Well, it ain't that, ain't that bad. Well, you know, God don't want me lonely and... And what the devil will tell you, if you lust, in a one, a lust after a woman in your heart, you already committed the act. Well, you know, already committed the act. You, might, you already lusted. You might as well follow through. You got to repent anyway. You done got this far. You got to step two, so you might as well do three and four. You already sin anyway. So that's how the devil set you up. Amen. So the mind reasons the cause to pursue it. Number four, next there's a decision or a choice of the will. So your mind plots how you're going to carry it out. Now the will says, too late now. Amen. Number five, last, the will engages to achieve its desire. So it all starts where? It starts in the heart. So a careless, neglected heart is an easy prey for Satan in the hour of temptation. Now, there's something called an hour of temptation. It's, it's, it's a point in all our lives when the, when the flame is turned all the way up, that burner is turned all the way up, and you're feeling it. You're sweating. You're hot. You feel it. You feel the, you feel the, you feel the pressure. It's all the way up. That, that water is boiling now. It's at that point. It's an hour of temptation. So in the hour of temptation, Satan aims at the heart. We think it's our mind. Oh, you ought to go and do that. You know, well, you know, I, I can't. You ought to go. No, he's not naming at our mind because if your heart is right, regardless of what thoughts he put in your mind, you ain't going to carry it out. Because your heart, I ain't, ain't going to disobey God. I ain't going to do that to my wife. I ain't going to do that to my husband. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to do that because you know, and well, you know, ain't nobody looking. Nope, I'm not. Because my heart is dictating. So regardless of what's going on up here, if your heart is right. See, Satan don't attack the mind. Satan will put a thought up here. But guess what? If that thought coincides with this, you will end up doing it. But sooner or later, that's why he's going to keep pressing that button. Because he knows sooner or later. He knows what's in, see, Satan knows what's in your heart too. And he knows if he keep putting that thought there, sooner or later he's going he, he to keep coming back. He's going to keep coming back. All of a sudden, you done broke down because it's in there. And Satan knows it's in there. Amen. Lot's wife covered in the residue of a fallen society where God was destroying. It was evident. What was in here, now everybody see it. Now it's exposed for everybody to see. Don't try to hold on to what God is trying to get rid of. Amen. All of this happens within a few minutes. It, I'm not talking about a drawing out process. It's like those thoughts come just like that. It happens quick. It's like a sound bite. Wow. That's why you got to judge your, you got to judge yourself. You got to, you got to guard your heart from what's going out and what's coming in. I remember I was standing on the elevator one time. I'm getting ready to close. And uh, a woman got on. And I felt something. I said, okay. I said, now, is that coming from her or is that coming from me? I felt lust. I said, they're coming from her, they're coming from me. So what I did, I checked my heart first. I said, okay, is that me? No, it wasn't me. Amen. 
But I check my heart. Is that coming from me or is that coming from her? So you got to check your heart to make sure that, that you're right. That your heart is in the right standing with God. Guess what? God's going to judge our heart. The intent of our hearts. Did we have a heart? Was our heart inclined more towards him? Or, we, or did we do like Lot's wife? We went back. We're going, toward, we're going in one direction towards God, but our heart is going back towards the world, the things of the world. Amen. A watchful heart is on guard against temptation before it gains strength. Feed your heart the word of God, which is the best preservative against sin. Keep the word and the word will keep you. Colossians 3 and 16, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart. Let it dwell, dwell richly or plentifully in all that it contains, it commands, promises, and its warnings. In all that is in you, your understanding, your memory, your consciousness, and your affections, then it will preserve your heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's, that's the word for the day. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. I know I, was, I ran over a little bit, but... Uh, Praise the Lord. Guard your heart. It's the first to live and it's the last to die. And it's the hardest thing to keep in check. Because out of the heart proceed the issues of life. Like I say all the time, you can only reproduce what's inside of you. Sooner or later, it's going to come out. If you if you for God, it's going to come out. If you're not for God, it's going to show up. And guess when it shows up? It shows up when you're by yourself and it shows up when you're under pressure. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to get ready to dismiss. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to tell us the truth, Lord. Uh, you said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and my commandments are not grievous, Lord. Heavenly Father, uh, we realize that narrow is the way. Few there be that find it, Lord. Uh, Lord, when, when I stand before you, I want you to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Uh, I don't want you to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Heavenly Father, uh, help me to always have a spirit of repentance that I can repent on a daily basis and examine my heart, but not try to diagnose myself, but examine my heart and those issues that I know that aren't right, Lord, I want to lay them before you, God, that you can help me because I can... I can present it to you, but you're the only one that has the power to change me, Lord. God, and you said you won't withhold no good thing from them that walk upright before you, Lord. And now to him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the throne of grace, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet fellowship and communion of your spirit, rest, rule, abide. God, direct and keep and protect us now henceforth and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.